Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Budiman Minasni. I'm from the University of Sydney. So welcome to the 4 per 1000 scientific uh, webinar series. In this time, we'll have an interesting presentation. It, the topic of today's webinar is about balancing soil carbon gains and nitrous oxide emissions. Well, we know that uh, soil carbon is part of a natural climate solutions which can contribute to the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. However, there's another side of the story because an increasing soil organic carbon might also elevate uh, another greenhouse gas emissions, that is the nitrous oxide emissions. So it potentially could offset the benefits of soil carbon. So when we talk about soil carbon, we have also to talk about nitrogen and the possibility possibility of a nitrous oxide gas emissions. So today's joining us to discuss this topic, we have Dr. Shelby McClellan uh, in New York, Dr. Mark Farrell in Australia, and Dr. J.K. Lata in uh, California. So first off, let's invite Dr. Mark Farrell to give his presentation. Dr. Mark Farrell is a principal scientist at CSIRO in Australia. So he leads a research into carbon and nitrogen cycling in soils. Mark holds a PhD from the University of Wales in Bangor in the UK. And he has over 15 years of experience in a range of agricultural and natural systems research. And his current research includes the national pro projects in, that is quantifying soil carbon stocks. And his particular research interest is the interplay between carbon and nitrogen. So I'll hand over to you, uh, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for giving your time um, and attending today. And thank you, Budi, for the kind invitation and the excellent introduction. Um, so I won't dwell too long on, on the opening. Um, I'll just give a little bit of a background as to where I have come from. Um, so yes, as Budi mentioned, I actually grew, grew up in the UK and attended university in North Wales. Uh, where I worked as a postdoc in particular on dissolved organic nitrogen, and that has always necessarily tied my interest to carbon and nitrogen, given it contains both, um, and yeah, long-standing interest in soil carbon and nitrogen interactions more generally. Um, so yes, I've been now in Australia for coming up to 15 years, which surprises myself, my wife, and most other people, but here we are. It's been really good fun, and hopefully the next few minutes will be informative for you. Um, so I'll just start from the very beginning um, by stating the obvious. Carbon and nitrogen are usually interlinked. Um, There's this excellent meta-analysis from Jean Coelho, um, who was at CSIRO at the time, um, showing loss of carbon in Australian soils following conversion to agriculture and cultivation, um, a fairly classic figure these days, showing around about 50% loss carbon over that time since cultivation. And if we've lost carbon, um, we've almost certainly lost nitrogen too. Um, and coming now, um, fairly, fairly well known, but also occasionally lost at times in conversations about regenerative agriculture, et cetera, the importance of nitrogen for building carbon. Um, and this figure from Giesler and Scow's review back in 2014, really emphasizing the point that nitrogen is a, is a key, is really, really important if you're wanting to build carbon back up in agricultural systems. So that sort of sets the scene. Um, the two are linked and it is a little difficult to build one without the other, but building more carbon obviously leaves more reactive nitrogen in the system and that poses some potential problems. Um, you know, we typically view carbon and nitrogen and various other nutrients as stoichiometrically limited, constrained um, in, their, in their concentrations. So to build more stable carbon, you do need more nitrogen. Um, but if your carbon, of course, cycles, as does nitrogen, and as it cycles through the system and some is mineralized, so too likely is also some nitrogen. Now, that's mineralized in the similar rates to which plants are requiring it. Probably not an issue, but frequently, of course, we get pulses of nitrogen um, mineralization when plants are not able to take it up, and that's when we can get some nitrous oxide um, and other environmentally damaging um, losses happening. Um, 
And what really got me thinking about this space, in this space, um, a couple of years after it started at CSR, it was this wonderful paper by Son Kizal, um that was a modelling work and really posed the question as to whether or not if we're building organic matter, which requires us to increase the amount of reactive N in soils, is there a potential risk given the fact that carbon has to be kept in the ground and the greenhouse gas, the global warming potential of nitrous oxide being so high, whether, whether or not even a small amount of extra N2 emissions could offset a reasonable amount of that new carbon stock. Um, so I set about a study with a couple of colleagues of mine, um, Jeff Baldock, who's a name most people would recognise, and also Dr Lynn MacDonald. Um, and we were really interested in trying to find out, trying to find a, a situation where we had differences in, in soil carbon, whether differences in soil type, and that led us to centre pivot irrigation. Uh, we selected eight paddocks down in the lower southeast of South Australia um, and looked at organic matter um, quantity and quality, into our flux, and looked at a range of different nitrogen cycling assays. Most of this was done in the lab, um, necessarily due to due to um, constraints on logistics, etc. Um, and we incubated um, some intake cores for a period of one week looking at N2O flux and relating that back to soil carbon chemistry and, and quantity. And our first information, at least on the carbon perspective, um, so carbon range from about, um, I think it was, would have been 7.5% in the irrigated side, around about 5.8% in the dryland side. Now, for those in Australia, those are very high numbers. This is permanent pasture in a high rainfall zone. So not typical of all of Australia by any stretch of the imagination, but nonetheless a useful test case for this hypothesis. Um, carbon chemistry was moderately different. Um, expected differences in alkyl to alkyl ratio, which is a representation of the amount of cycling that has occurred and the amount of decomposition. Um, higher the number being the more decomposition. So more processed organic matter in the dryland relative to the fresher inputs in the irrigated. And if we look at all the different aspects of the NMR spectra on, on the one figure, um, you can see a reasonable difference between the two between the two um, types. So that sets the background as the soil. Um, nitrogen cycling. There was a significantly higher rate of N2O emissions in the soils from the irrigated systems. Now they were incubated at the same water holding capacity. Um, so we normalized for that, et cetera. So that wasn't an issue. This was an intrinsic feature of these soils as taken from the landscape. And that had us, yeah, that had us rather excited about this. Um, the paper, paper was published as a as a conference paper in the International Nation Initiative Conference um, that was in Melbourne in 2016. Unfortunately, as with many things in my life, I haven't managed to get it all the way through to uh, being written up properly, um, but it is available online and, and is searchable. And then due to other things, um, I had to pause for a little while on that line of research and a little later on picked it up in the world of cotton. And the person you see there is Talita Bailey, who was recently a PhD student with us. She's now a postdoc with Peter Grace at the QUT. And she did some really interesting mechanistic work in another irrigated system, cotton. Um, most of this was done in northern New South Wales in Australia. Um, and the first of the two studies I'm going to go over, go over um, of her work um we're looking at how different fractions of organic matter behaved and whether or not the nitrogen in those two fractions followed the carbon around so collected soils from a long-term irrigated cotton experiment and they nearby native vegetation remnant vegetation they were taken from three treatments in the cropping system um, and also the native vegetation fractionated using the usual 50 micron um size fractionation, and then we incubated them, those fractions, also unfractionated and fractionated, but recombined. So the soil had been through the destructive fractionation process and put back together again in a sudden matrix to try and understand the intrinsic stability of carbon and nitrogen in these two fractions that are often used as really strong functional descriptors as much as they are recognized as being operational. So first of all, looking at extractable nitrogen um, in the whole, um, that increased in the whole soil over the time period, in the whole, both the whole soil and the fractionated whole soil. The native vegetation was slightly different, and the native vegetation had much higher organic matter 
um, content to start with, that was nearer 5%, whereas the irrigated, intensively cultivated and irrigated cotton was nearer 1% to 1.5%. Um, the nitrogen available in both those fractions went down, and this perhaps didn't surprise us too much. What happened next, though, was rather interesting when looking at the CO2. Um, and we saw different trends here. In actual fact, the fine fractions, so approximating MAOM, lost the most carbon, shortly followed by the coarse fraction and the fractionated whole soil, whereas the unfractionated whole soil, generally speaking, lost much less carbon. So whilst this perhaps isn't telling us the whole story about carbon and nitrogen interactions, it is showing a tendency under severe disturbance for the two to behave slightly differently, um, a point we did make in writing up this, this was recently published in EJSS, um, was that the difficulties in extracting fractions and being able to use them in a in a robust way in ongoing incubation experiments does sort of pose a question for this sort of um, experimentation. We're quite open about that. And having that fractionated whole soil treatment in there was able to show us perhaps the artifacts that come from trying to separate fractions and then interrogate them individually. Um, but as I said, it does suggest that carbon and nitrogen are not necessarily behaving the same way, at least in this vertical in New South Wales. So moving on to another study that Talita is currently writing up. So these are data from her thesis. Um, we specifically looked at interactions between carbon and N2O in these soils. And we took one soil and loaded it up with C4 organic matter, so sugarcane, so we could chase trace the difference in carbon. I won't be presenting that data here, but we pre incubated them to six weeks to generate soils of different organic matter concentrations. And we added nutrients at that stage at stoichiometrically calculated ratios to try and get more stabilized organic matter rather than just burning through the, the sugarcane material. Um, and after six weeks, we added some 15N labeled urea at field equivalent rates. Cotton is usually irrigated around the 200 to 400 kilos per hectare. Um, nitrogen in these systems, and then we incubated them for 28 days. Collected headspace and gases, greenhouse gas um, measurements, destructively harvest several of them on days 1, 3, 7, and 28 for soil analysis. Um, so the CO2 data isn't remotely surprising. Um, the more carbon you had, the greater the CO2. Um, not too surprising. There's 5% carbon in the dark purple one, um, and no addition in the orange. And so when looking at N2O, we thought we might see something a little bit similar. Um, the first curiosity here is that yellow line there is actually the nitrogen, uh, the zero carbon control with nitrogen added. So you see there's a little bit of a spike after that nitrogen has been added, and we put this down to they're not meeting the carbon to soak up extra nitrogen through heterotrophic activity of the microbes in those treatments. However, that's not the curious result. Um, this one, the green line, that's an e intermediate carbon um, treatment. So the highest ones appear to be preventing nitrous oxide, much nitrous oxide from appearing at all, presumably because of microbial demand for nitrogen. The lowest one you see a little bit and then it reaches an asymptote. This one, really too cropping. You can see from the error bars, this isn't an artifact. This is real data. And we struggled for a while to really work out what was going on here. And in the end, decided that we'd actually have to look at the microbial side of the question and more thoroughly. So to lead to work with Paul Dennis at UQ to do some microbial metagenomics. Now, the area I want you to focus on is the green box there, which is the one carbon plus nitrogen, which is the treatment where the nitrous oxides took off. And in there, you can see it's it's definitely intermediate to the no carbon and the higher carbon treatments. Um, but there are some areas where it sits out alone, um, particularly NOB, which is a nitric oxide um, reducer, NERK, and also this HCP gene. And digging a little bit further in here um, at that NOB gene, Day seven in particular, you can see it with very tight error bars, well above the other treatments. And it appears that whatever we managed to do with that treatment seems to have triggered conditions suitable for denitrification uh, without much in the way of an increase in NOS-Z, which is the 
the final gene that would take nitrous oxide all the way to N2. So I suppose without being able to give complete mechanistic certainty around this, what we're thinking here is that there are situations where, which might not even be that obvious, where carbon and nitrogen can interplay to result in, in quite a big spike and because of the amount of warming potential that nitrous oxide carries, it perhaps doesn't have to be that much or that often to have a significant um, impact against any gains that were made from the carbon side of things. So coming through to, to just wrap up now, um, so at the high level, carbon and nitrogen are linked in soil organic matter to a point, and I make that clear to a point, when it gets down to mineralization, obviously CO2 leaves, and that leaves some excess nitrogen to, to which something will happen. It might be taken up by a plant, it might be taken back up by more heterotrophs and cycled around, but it does leave it potentially available to losses. Um, and higher carbon likely results in higher carbon turnover and therefore likely results in higher nitrogen cycling, which again does leave the possibility of N2O being a risk. I would say that our results, particularly the the fact that it was the intermediate result from that incubation experiment, um, and this ties up with other data that's that's around about out there, that it's not always the most obvious treatments that might cause this, which means in hetero heterogeneous environmental systems where you've got wetting and drying, etc. Not always particularly obvious when you might be at greatest risk of producing fluxes of nitrous oxide in systems and the interplay between, say, additions of carbon to those and how they might interact with them. Um, and I would have to say, um, I'm as cautionary as, as well at the start, that it can't be taken for granted that increasing carbon won't do something with nitrous oxide emissions that could go some way to suddenly offsetting um, those gains that were hoped to be made. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, particularly thank um, my colleagues, Jeff, Lynn, Andrea, Tom, Janine, Tim, who's now at the University of Sydney, Dio and Ben, and also at UQ, Talita, Nicole Robinson, who was Talita's main supervisor, and Paul Dennis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for the interesting presentation and intriguing results. So why don't we uh, continue with uh, Shelby uh, for her presentation. Uh, Shelby, Shelby McClellan is now at the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University. She's an ecos ecosystem ecologist and biogeochemist with a research interest in climate change and food systems. So Shelby had a PhD at Colorado, Colorado State University, and then she also had a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell University before she's joining the New York uh, University. Uh, Shelby has a particular interest in the trade-off and yield and land use and biodiversity associated with, with various mitigation pathway towards limiting global temperatures well below two degrees Celsius. And over to you, Shelby. Great, thanks, Budi, for that introduction. I take it you can hear me all well. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank you again for the opportunity to be here, and thank you to Mark for that wonderful setup. I am going. We you know really just saw it down at a very granular scale, talking about microbes and and gene abundances, and now we're going to go all the way up to the global scale with this work that I'm going to discuss with you all today. Uh, but before I launch into uh, this work, I want to first acknowledge all of our funders that have been a part of this work, um, as well as all of my wonderful collaborators who have helped make contributions to this research. So as we know, uh, decarbonization of agriculture is critical for meeting the 1.5 degree global temperature target. Natural climate solutions are deliberate human actions that protect, restore, and improve management of forests, wetlands, oceans, and agricultural lands to mitigate climate change. And so right now, as you know, four per mil uh, has been a big part of this. Uh, there's a lot of momentum around the improved management of agricultural lands, especially management that builds soil carbon. And so improved management of soil includes building back soil carbon stocks, uh, protecting existing soil carbon, so carbon that's already there, as well as reducing emissions of nitrous oxide and methane. So for example, cover crops can increase additions of organic matter by helping uh, elevate 
uh, net primary production in agricultural systems, while no tillage through reducing soil disturbance can help reduce soil carbon losses and protect existing soil carbon. And beyond carbon, we know there are numerous co-benefits associated with these improved management practices, uh, including enhanced food production. But of course, as the saying goes, there's no such thing as a free lunch and that there is emerging evidence of greenhouse gas trade-offs, especially nitrous oxide emissions that exist with agricultural natural climate solution practices. And this isn't entirely unexpected since as we just heard, uh, management of soil carbon will inadvertently impact nitrogen because of this often tight coupling that we see between these two elements in the soil. So when we alter the balance of soil carbon, um, we also are altering the amount of mineral nitrogen, which is one of the key drivers of soil nitrous oxide emissions, among other conditions that tend to favor the production of nitrous oxide via nitrification and denitrification pathways. So for example, grass cover crops may help to lower denitrification nitrous oxide emissions by immobilizing nitrogen in plant tissues. Uh, so again, this would lower the availability of nitrogen available for into a production. Whereas the planting of a legume cover crop, on the other hand, might actually increase into a production because of biological nitrogen fixation. No tillage by creating soil conditions that are favorable to anaerobic denitrifiers may increase denitrification, uh, but they might all no tillage might also create soil conditions that are favorable to complete reduction of nitrate to nitrogen gas. So meta-analyses suggest that. On average, uh, we expect to see higher soil nitrous oxide emissions associated with these practices, um, and that these emissions may partially but not fully offset the benefits we see from soil carbon. Thus, policy and management really needs to be informed by joint carbon and nitrogen impacts, in other words, net or combined greenhouse gas emission responses to avoid overestimating the climate benefits of natural climate solutions. So what does this mean for large-scale deployment, deployment of agricultural natural climate solutions? So my colleagues at Colorado State University and I were interested in this. And so we found that when we adopt uh, cover crops at the national scale in the US on around 74 million hectares of new cropland, we can see carbon sequestration around 36 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year over 20 years. However, when we consider nitrous oxide emissions alongside this, um, we don't necessarily see a large difference in this mitigation potential, but we do see a large increase in the uncertainty of this mitigation potential, somewhere on the order of 40%. And so again, while we didn't see a national level trade-off, we did actually, when we looked at the regional scale, see some uh, local nitrous oxide emission trade-offs emerge, especially in areas where it's not common to have a legume in a uh, cropping system rotation. So that previous work and the work I'm going to be talking about today concerns estimates made from Descent. And this is a process model that simulates changes in ecosystem dynamics in response to changes in land management and to climate. So Descent models soil carbon and nitrogen cycling between atmospheric plant and soil pools. And it represents many different ecological processes, including but not limited to nitrification and denitrification leading to soil nitrous oxide, soil organic matter decomposition, plant growth, and management and other events. And as a tier three model, it's particularly useful for estimating soil carbon and greenhouse gas emissions resulting from management changes. Uh, and Dacent is also the underlying model of the crop cropland portion of the U.S. National Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And I've also been involved in recent efforts to help calibrate and validate Descent with cover crop production data, uh, including soil carbon changes and soil nitrous oxide emission responses to cover crops. So in the work I'm going to talk about today, we simulated global soil greenhouse gas emission responses, uh, both soil carbon and nitrous oxide emissions, to changes in soil management uh, at a half degree spatial resolution. So we ran the descent model um, for every grid cell for which we had cropland. And first we did this under a spin up period uh, to reach steady state soil carbon stocks under natural vegetation conditions. We then used a geospatial data layer of time varying agricultural conversion years 
uh, for three different major commodity crops that cover about one half to one third of global cropland area. Um, but they represent about 99% of the total uh, area where we have cropland cropping systems. Um, so crops were managed according to historical practices, uh, including irrigation and rain fed management. And we also had variable nitrogen management, including time varying inputs of nitrogen fertilizer and manure nitrogen. And this version of Dayson also incorporates recent work by my colleague Yi Yang at CSU uh, to match crop yield data to FALSTAT data. And so we then did a scenario analysis uh, once we had this historical cropping management where we continued management from 2016 through end of century under uh, typical management practices, but also these various uh, natural climate solution management practices, uh, no tillage, grass and legume cover cropping, either as individual practices or combined. Um, and all of these uh, practices were simulated with SSP 370. And so the responses I'm going to talk about today are expressed as a crop area weighted mean, simply meaning that we have one response at the grid cell level, and this response is weighted by the amount of cropland area type within that grid cell. Um, and emissions are also reported relative to the reference case, so again, relative to continued management. And all emissions are expressed as carbon dioxide equivalent based on ARA6 values. So what we're looking at here is a map of annual nitrous oxide emissions difference from implementing no tillage on croplands at mid-century. So pink colors indicate higher nitrous oxide emissions uh, compared to conventional practices, while uh, the green colors indicate lower nitrous oxide emissions. So what we see here is that there tends to be higher nitrous oxide emissions at low latitudes from no tillage and lower nitrous oxide emissions at higher latitudes, which again, we see in those green shades. And this trend tends to be amplified at end of century with more regions throughout South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia and the Pacific showing higher nitrous oxide emissions. And when we look at this at the global scale through this density plot, we can see that the nitrous oxide emissions difference under no tillage across each of the 24 different climates that we simulated for SSP 370 from CMIP 6 uh, tended to lead to about 6% lower nitrous oxide emissions at mid-century, oops, excuse me, while at uh, end of century, uh, there was a negligible difference. And so these re results largely align with meta-analysis results that find a minimal effect of no tillage on soil nitrous oxide emissions. So turning now to grass cover crops, we see a greater prevalence of higher nitrous oxide emissions at mid-century. So grass cover crops only led to lower soil nitrous oxide emissions uh, at higher northern latitudes. And we tend to see hot spots of higher nitrous oxide emissions emerge in uh, North and Central America, uh, the Middle East, and South and Eastern Asia. And so again, these spatial patterns tended to be exacerbated at end of century, especially in North America and in Europe. And so we again see these temporal trends at the global scale. So nitrous oxide emissions at mid-century tended to be uh, higher by about 31%. Um, and at end of century, they tended to be about 44% higher. So right over time, we see this, this elevation in nitrous oxide emissions. And so unlike no tillage or grass cover crops, legume cover crops elevated nitrous oxide emissions in almost all of the cropland area that we simulated. And so we see critical hotspots uh, emerge in North and Central America, South Asia, as well as China. And again, we see a similar pattern at end of century. So global uh, mid-century soil nitrous oxide emissions were about 0.45 megagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year, uh, or about 69% higher compared to that continued management case. And again, we see this rightward shift um, by end of century where emissions of nitrous oxide with legume cover crops were about 80% higher compared uh, to continued management. So a good question uh, from all of that is, well, what exactly, what biophysical or management drivers are actually contributing to this elevated nitrous oxide emission response to these practices? 
So to tease apart these drivers, we use supervised machine learning with random forest and Shapley additive explanation values uh, to get at these drivers. And shaft values are simply indicative of how important a feature is in our model uh, to predicting the target variable. So for legume cover crops that we see here in this leftmost graph, um, we see that site conditions, uh, particularly soil bulk density and soil uh, clay fraction had an important impact on uh, elevated nitrous oxide emission response. So soils that tended to be higher in bulk density and higher in soil clay fraction uh, had higher nitrous oxide emissions. We also see that the change in gross nitrification, um, which would uh, influence the amount of mineral nitrogen available um, for nitrous oxide emission production also tended to be important. For grass cover crops, many of these same features came out as important, although we see nitrogen inputs, um, which is a combination of fertilizer and manure nitrogen, uh, tended to be more important for predicting uh, nitrous oxide emission response. And unlike cover crops, no tillage response was driven less by site conditions and more by uh, these nitrogen dynamics that are happening uh, within the model, as well as mean annual temperature. So I think what we all are probably most interested in knowing, knowing uh, that we have these elevated nitrous oxide emission responses is how much um, does N2O actually offset soil carbon benefits that we expect to see from these practices? So here on the left, we can see annual soil carbon sequestration estimated through the near and medium term. And then when we overlay uh, nitrous oxide emissions responses on this, we now have the annual greenhouse gas mitigation potential. And we do see that emissions are offset. Uh, Mid-century uh, soil nitrous oxide offsets uh, emissions by about 45%. And we actually completely offset emissions at 2100. And so aggregated, or sorry, excuse me, aggregated at the global scale across around 405 million hectares of cropland, we find that at 2050, the global greenhouse gas mitigation potential for legume cover crops is around 28 petagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Um, but when we take this out to 2100, we actually see a slight increase in emissions. So now we're looking at the soil carbon response from grass cover crops and again overlaid with nitrous oxide emissions for an annual greenhouse gas mitigation potential. And we see that nitrous oxide emissions offsets uh, emissions at 2050 by around 29% and by about 71% at end of century. This brings um, mid-century uh, greenhouse gas mitigation potential to about point to two petagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, so fairly similar to legume cover crops. Um, and we have a slightly, uh, we have slight mitigation potential at end of century. Uh, so now looking at no tillage, again, we see slightly similar um, per hectare per year responses of soil carbon. But because we didn't see such a big soil nitrous oxide emissions response, um, the greenhouse gas mitigation potential is higher than it is for, for cover cropping. And so, um, no tillage uh, actually led to higher greenhouse gas mitigation potential at mid-century by around 5%, um, but there was a negligible impact at 2100, um, and we saw that reflected in those maps from a few slides ago. So because we can practice uh, no tillage on a little bit more cropland, around 25, sorry, excuse me, 525 million hectares of cropland, we see that there is about 0.48 petagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent per year potential in 2050 and a slightly lower potential of around 0.24 petagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent per year uh, in 2100. And so I do want to point out that there's still some controversy whether or not no-tillage is actually a natural climate solution. Um, I will point out that the estimates that we find here at the global scale do align with literature estimates um, that do consider limitations of no-tillage uh, as a soil carbon sequestration strategy. Um, and I think these results are very much in line with what we would expect to see um, from no tillage because uh, Dacent is only reflecting soil carbon changes in the top 30 centimeters of soil, which is where we would expect again to see no tillage benefits. So mitigation estimates of natural climate solutions often reflect multiple time horizons uh, to be in alignment with IPCC reporting. And so here I focused on right mid-century and end of century greenhouse gas mitigation potential. And this is really important because we expect to see most of the benefits 
of agricultural natural climate solutions in the couple of decades following their adoption. Um, but annual mitigation potential is expected to decline as soil reaches new steady state soil carbon levels. And so we very much see this dynamic in this graph here um, in the global annual mean response of soil organic carbon nitrous oxide emissions, which we see in black and greenhouse gas mitigation potential, which is reflected in the blue purple color, um, which is estimated for each decade following the adoption of legume cover crops. Um, we see a very similar trend. Um, for grass cover cropping, um, where soil carbon sequestration declines, uh, especially from 2030 to 2050. Um, and then uh, we see that nitrous oxide emissions remain elevated. And so this is really what is leading to this net neutral response and this decadal mean annual mitigation potential around mid-century and even uh, higher emissions under this practice uh, after mid-century. No tillage again follows a similar pattern for soil carbon, but again, because of the soil nitrous oxide emission uh, response being uh, less than it was for cover crops, um, the greenhouse gas mitigation potential is less affected. And so really these temporal trends underscore the importance of looking at greenhouse gas balance over multiple decades and considering these dynamics and policy and land management planning. So, um, one question we might also have is whether or not combining no tillage and cover cropping can lead to better mitigation outcomes. And so here, this is uh, modeled results that we have from combining no tillage and legume cover cropping. And we can see how there's a much higher soil carbon sequestration rate than we saw from just either of these practices alone. And because of this higher soil carbon sequestration that we find, we do um, help to offset this elevated nitrous oxide emissions response. Um, this brings the decadal mean greenhouse gas mitigation rate um, or maintains it being, you know, mostly beneficial until around uh, the later part of the 21st century. Um, something important to note with this, though, is that there's still very limited uh, meta-analyses actually showing um, this type of response from combining agricultural natural climate solutions. And so really, uh, this type of model estimate really does need to be backed up by additional empirical studies. So another aspect of my work uh, that Booney mentioned is contextualizing the effects of natural climate solutions in light of other sustainable development goals and environmental challenges. Climate mitigation uh, efforts in agriculture must not lose sight of productivity impacts. And we know that global food demand is supposed to increase anywhere from 50 to 60 percent by 2050. And previous assessments of agricultural natural climate solutions uh, largely assume that they will be a win-win for climate and food, uh, but this assumption is largely untested. And previous assessments have included some protections for land use, so not allowing cropland to go into uh, or be reforested, for instance, um, but assessments haven't directly looked at direct crop yield impacts. Um, and so practices that result in lower yields risk leakage and cropland area expansion, which would seriously jeopardize uh, greenhouse gas mitigation efforts. So our modeled results indicate that agricultural natural climate solutions will lead to some crop yield reductions um, in many, but not necessarily all cases. However, by balancing these goals, both climate and food, we found that a diverse portfolio of natural climate solutions, which you see reflected here in this map, could lead to mid-century greenhouse gas mitigation of 28 petagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, while raising crop yields by around 250 teragrams per year. Um, and most of these higher crop yields are realized through practicing legume cover cropping. And so here we find um, kind of what this looks like at a regional scale, and we find that around half of locations in Asia and developing Pacific, Africa and Middle East, and Latin America and the Caribbean should adopt legume cover crops, no tillage, uh, and have higher residue retention rates. Um, however, we find that cover crops are less optimal in developed countries, and Eastern Europe and West Central Asia, where no tillage uh, tends to be a more beneficial practice. And you'll see here in this lower plot that by region, we find the highest modeled mid-century greenhouse gas mitigation potential to be from Latin America and the Caribbean. So our modeled results show that agricultural natural climate solutions, especially cover crops, do elevate soil nitrous oxide emissions, partially offsetting soil carbon benefits. 
And we also found that this effect increases over longer time horizons. So really what I think this work is showing is that we must account for nitrous oxide or we will end up overestimating the greenhouse gas mitigation potential of natural climate solutions. So policies and incentive mecha mechanisms must consider net, not just soil carbon impacts. So an opportunity area to perhaps uh, re uh, reduce soil nitrous oxide emissions under these practices would involve improving nitrogen management, especially reducing nitrogen inputs to match the expected biological nitrogen, nitrogen fixation coming from legumes. However, U.S. cover crop surveys that have been done over the past several years still suggest that producers are not actually reducing nitrogen fertilization rates even when they adopt cover cropping. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why we didn't actually model fertilizer reductions in uh, our simulations. So furthermore, our near and mid medium term greenhouse gas mitigation potential um, ends up really being relatively modest and generally lower than previous estimates. So to put into context, um, our yield safeguarded estimate that I presented on the last slide around 28 petagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, through 2050, um, which again is greenhouse gas mitigation potential for around 35 years, equates to little more than 50% of one year of current global greenhouse gas emissions. So not to say that these practices aren't important, but there might be other reasons, again, beyond climate for why we might want to implement them. So really, I think this work brings attention to the need for wider systems thinking in agriculture and the food system. So improved soil management as a climate solution on existing cropland, um, which includes crops produced for human consumption, but also for animal feed and for fuel, has a clear upper bound on potential. And so to realize climate targets, we really need to be thinking more about what food we're growing um, and the carbon opportunity costs that they incur. So freeing up land by changing what we grow and how we grow it will be an important part of the climate solutions portfolio. And with that, I am happy to take any questions and thank you again for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Shelby, for the wonderful presentation and uh, in, intriguing thoughts. So, so uh, probably uh, so for for the audience, if you want to ask questions, there's a on the bottom of the menu. There's a Q and A. Please type in your questions and and we'll we'll raise this uh, uh, to to the speakers later. But first of all, I think we'll have a discussion with our uh, STC member, the Volper Mill. Uh, scientific committee member. We have Dr. J.K. Lada here. J.K. is a soil microbiologist and agronomist with more than 35 years of experience on various aspects of sustainable management of agriculture and natural resources, particularly for food security and environmental quality. And his uh, research topic that of his interest is uh, nitrogen, which he is called as an intriguing enigma. So uh, indeed that uh, when we talk about car carbon, we have to talk about nitrogen and probably uh, possible nitrous oxide leakage. So over to you, JK. Thank you, Budi. <clears throat> so it was very interesting to listen to both Mark and Shelby. And uh, I must say that probably I'm coming from a, a different, slightly different side, although it's still carbon nitrogen. But I think, uh, let me share with you some of my thoughts, which I put together quickly. So uh, I think the topic of this webinar is balancing soil carbon gains and nitrous oxide emissions. And then it, it addressed the potential negative offset of uh, beneficial carbon sequestration by increased nitrous oxide emission. So I think the un underlying hypothesis is that uh, when there is a carbon sequestration, and uh, then there is going to be more nitrous oxide emission. So this is something um, I never thought about it, especially in intensive uh, croplands or cropping systems uh, in Asia. So I thought it will be nice to kind of address what, how do we define carbon sequestration? And is it when we increase soil carbon stock, which may be temporary phenomena, and I always thought this definition uh, is kind of a misleading. And, and those who have read the paper by Bernard et al. 2005, and he defines soil carbon sequestration, or he says sometimes uh, it's soil plant carbon sequestration. 
and it should consider uh, the result of net balance of greenhouse gas emissions expressed in carbon CO2 or carbon equivalent CO2 and computing all emission sources and sync of a given agroecosystem in comparison to a reference agroecosystem. I think the definition of carbon sequestration should encompass not only the uh, components of soil earning matter in terms of carbon storage, sometimes we call it loosely carbon sequestration, uh, which I think is, is uh, you know, it's kind of questionable, but also greenhouse gas mitigation. But not only these two elements, but also the characteristic dynamic turnover that results in labile pools and essential for maintaining soil health. And then soil health is, is what then drive the crop production of crop yields. So there are, there, are, there are two highly related aspects of carbon sequestration that aim to uh, attain high uh, food security under a changing climate. One is reducing greenhouse gas emission for mitigating climate change. And the second one, increasing carbon storage, uh, which may or may not happen all the time. Uh, but more important is the dynamic pool, which drives up, uh, the cycling of nutrients. I think that's very important. So the question is, uh, do best management practices or so-called natural climate solution increase soil carbon stock? Of course, all these practices, and simply we can define as best management, agronomic best management practices, definitely will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Hence, this is, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a way, it's also sequestering carbon because it's removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And among the best management practices, at least in, uh, in crop production, I would say smart nitrogen management, probably low hanging fruits. And why I say that uh, in most uh, all over Asia and, and China, India, especially, there is excess use, I often call it misuse of nitrogen. And then there is a uh, you know, substantial opportunity or significant opportunity to reduce those nitrogen rates and then reduce the emissions. So next question could be, is it really true that when there is carbon sequestration, there is more uh, nitrous, ox uh, nitrous oxide emission? I think both the speakers uh, seem to suggest that. There is this emerging evidence that uh, maybe, I don't know, um, in my opinion, we probably need more data, especially uh, from tropical, cropping systems where carbon input is not so much. My experience is that you know, carbon kind of reaching to a, a steady state, uh, whatever had to happen in terms of uh, reducing carbon, it has declined in most of the agriculture soils. And it's very, very hard to increase carbon unless we really put in uh, material like biochar, which has its own uh, issues in terms of whole uh, cycling, carbon cycling, a uh, life cycle. So as carbon and nitrogen cycle in soils depend heavily on climate and soil type, how reliable are current model models, uh, which I think shall be presented in estimating nitrous oxide emission across various carbon sequestration practices and, and what improvements data are needed to enhance accuracy especially for large scale application. And this is something uh, Budi and I have been discussing also. Another question which during discussion came up with Budi is, as many countries or organization pledge to nitrogen zero in agriculture, how might combining our soil carbon practices such as no-till uh, or cover cropping, uh, to some extent, both the speakers touched on those, uh, not so much agroforestry, uh, was addressed today, enhance or compl compliance of soil carbon storage and nitrous oxide emissions outcome. And, and what are the research gaps exist in understanding the synergies or trade-offs between these uh, combined practices? So, Woody, I have this uh, set of questions and the, we don't have to address all of those, but uh, maybe it will be nice to hear from both the speakers from a different um, perspective, I guess, and, and it's, it's slightly 
uh, going out of what they they have been doing or they have been talking about. Hey, thanks, Jake. Yeah, I think it's a good good set of uh, discussion that I think both of uh, Shelby and Mark Farrell could provide some insight from their from their uh, from their studies. Maybe to start with, uh, from Shelby, is that continuing from your presentation? I think one of the discussion point that uh, JK asks is that, so how, how robust are these uh, models which model carbon sequestration and nitrous oxide emission over different, different soil types and different management practices? Or what kind of, what or maybe framing it, what kind of a, uh, research data are needed to to uh to ensure that we have more certainty on on these models yeah that's an that's an excellent question um and one that i that's really been top of mind for me as we you know try to answer these questions and as we're trying to to guide decision making around natural climate solutions so there's been quite a bit of work in day since um to improve the the soil carbon uh, sequestration estimates, especially under practice change, um, I didn't go through the list of, of work by my colleagues to to improve this version of the model. Um, there, of course, has been work on nitrous oxide emissions as well, um, but there do tend to be a lot fewer long term data sets there, um, and that's certainly uh, certainly a gap. Um, and one that the the modeling team on Jason is very much aware of and, and working on. Um, I showed the result from the U.S. national study on on cover crops, um, which did you know incorporate uncertainty. So that's work that we plan to do for this global scale work is trying to incorporate uncertainty of these outcomes. Uh, but in the past, when I've worked with the model to try to calibrate and validate it for soil carbon and, and nitrous oxide emission responses uh, using empirical data. Uh, data, there's just really a mismatch of what we need on the modeling side versus what we actually find in empirical work. Um, for example, uh, on the nitrous oxide emission side, uh, there just often are not measurements at the frequency that we need to be able to predict these dynamics. Um, often folks, and I, totally sympathize with this, having done a lot of field research in the past myself with greenhouse gas flux data, um, are only taking these measurements um, maybe two times a week, oftentimes once a week, or even more infrequently than that, and often only during the, the field season, um, and so not annually, and where we might actually be missing a lot of emissions. And there's been work out of California kind of showing um, these kind of hot spots, if you will, of, of nitrous oxide emissions. And so I really think there needs to be a better communication and collaboration between folks who are actually collecting these data in the field. And then on the modeling side, we're actually trying to represent these processes and actually capture capture the emissions responses that we see. Uh, and um, I think I'm seeing some kind of chatter maybe coming through the, the Q&A and maybe there'll be a chance to um, answer that for folks. But uh, yeah, a lot of these long-term data sets are coming from temperate regions. Um, of course, uh, the model that we've built for actually estimating uncertainty behind descent uh, does take into account um, global long-term field studies. Uh, but again, there's a lot fewer data available from those sites. And so we really need to be um, working in a more diverse range of regions um, to really be capturing the specificity there um, to be able to represent that better. Okay, thank you, Shelby. And maybe to, to Mark, a uh, comment about the 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 nitrogen management. So should the nitrogen management options is the low like low hanging fruit rather than we're trying to to, to put more carbon in the soil. This is um this is where context matters. Um so I presented data from two high nitrogen situations um in Australia. Most of my work as, as people, perhaps in Australia more than overseas, would be aware is in Australian dryland grains agriculture, um, where typically more nitrogen is exported in the protein of the grain than is applied by nitrogen in the first place. Um, and nitrogen limitation is one of the major limiting factors to achieving water limited yield potential. Um, 
similar situations occur certainly in sub-Saharan Africa. I've had some interesting conversations with Remy Cardinal and his colleagues over the last little while about that area also. Um, I think it's it's also worth noting that that native systems in weather, you know, acacia dominated areas, they, there is some nitrous oxide generated there too. It is a natural process. I think there are limitations to yeah, it's a fundament, fundamental feature of the land of the of how the land is managed, you know, of how the land is managed managed and what crops or pasture are grown there. I don't think it's a realistic opportunity to reduce it completely. And of course, whilst over application of nitrogen is certainly a low-hanging fruit, um, for a large part of Australia at least, where I do most of my research, that wouldn't be necessarily the right way forward in a lot of cases. Uh, we saw that figure um, that I presented, um, Giesler and Scow, showing to build nit to build carbon, you may need more nitrogen. And of course, everybody aware would be aware of how much more food we get per square kilometre because of nitrogen. Does that mean that we shouldn't be looking at alternatives? No, I would definitely say it doesn't. Um, building more legumes into crop rotations, I think, has the opportunity to be a bit of a win-win there at least in offsetting then the embedded energy in producing nitrogen fertilizer in the first place but as shelby's modeling data shown and i've seen plenty of other data just because it was fixed by a legume doesn't necessarily mean some of it won't be lost as nitrous oxide in actual fact at the microsite level you have labile carbon and labile nitrogen um very close to in very close proximity as, as legume material breaks down which might well lend in certain circumstances to those strange situations like the one I presented with that intermediate um, data that didn't involve the legumes there. But but there are those situations I think would be terribly difficult to, it's hard enough to really get a full mechanistic understanding of what happened in those situations. Never mind, get it robust enough and generalizable that we stand at hope of being able to model it through space and time. Um, so I think where where it is known that there is gross over application of fertilizer, absolutely applying less is the lowest hanging fruit of all. But I would not want a listener to come away from here thinking that the message was we need to stop applying nitrogen. Um, otherwise, we will need to clear an awful lot more land to feed the people we already have, never mind the people we will have. OK, thanks, Mark. So, so there's a question from Peter to me, but I think it's, it's relevant to you both, is that about, uh, so because of this uh, nitrous oxide thing, and also I think JK has said, so is it really true that when there is more carbon sequestration, then there is more nitrous oxide emission, and should we, should we not encourage more carbon sequestration, or... <laughs> Or should we say that uh, soil carbon is is uh, nothing to do with the climate change mitigation? Probably that's the that's the question. I'll try to make an attempt at answering that first from a modeling perspective, Budi. So, uh, the work that I showed from my colleague Lisa Ish uh, around the U.S. assessment of cover crop potential, uh, she also looked at what was the drivers behind the kind of variable nitrous oxide emission response that we observed there and actually found that the change in soil carbon was actually a poor predictor for predicting nitrous oxide emission. So not always does the change in soil carbon lead to higher nitrous oxide emissions. Um, so there are other dynamics at play that are leading to these changes. But I do think it's very important that we Again, as I try to stress throughout my talk, and I think Mark did as well, is that it's really important that we don't only focus on one greenhouse gas impact. We have to think about all of them and really be talking about this from the point of view of this kind of net or combined response um, that we see. Um, but very much so, there's still a lot of reasons why we want to be doing these practices, right? It's not, we shouldn't just have this pure, pure carbon focus. There's these, you know, other benefits, um, co-benefits that we expect to see, um, these food production benefits, um, and just these other ecosystem services, if you will. Um, and so I think really trying to emphasize those reasons beyond just the pure climate impact is really would be really important and helpful um, as we move forward in, in the conversation around 
around natural climate solutions. Yeah, I think, Budi, that's very true, what Shelby says. If we just take an example of no-till, for example, uh, no-till, uh, I mean, the data, published data seems to suggest that uh, there is no net increase in carbon, soil carbon stocks. Uh, you may get some increase in surface layer, but deeper layer probably, uh, you know, till system has much more carbon. So when you do total balance of, let's say, total profile, 50 centimeter or whatever, then you don't see any change. But then there are numerous other benefits of going for no-till and, and, and farmers uh, find it very attractive because your cost of cultivation goes down. And of course, there are indirect benefits in terms of less use of fossil fuel and, and agrochemicals. And, and especially when you are not tilling the land, then you're saving in terms of energy, uh, which is of course fossil, fossil fuel based. And so that's where you have indirect positive effect. So I think um, uh, this whole idea of, uh, I, I might be kind of moving into a slightly different territory. This carbon credit is, is something uh, is probably misplaced. Uh, one should be talking about incentivizing farmers for, uh, for following good management practices uh, rather than uh, you know, worrying too much about carbon credit or things like that. Mark, do you have any comments? Um, I think that, yeah, so no, no till curiously, yeah, no till has been adopted so widely in, in Australia. Um, you know, I started working here nearly 15 years ago and it was already well on its way to being the main land management practice. So Australia has been doing it for so long, we're actually sort of reaching the next questions of stratification, how do you manage other aspects there, which leads you back a little bit to to occasional strategic tillage, perhaps specifically in mind to deal with subsurface constraints that build up. Um, going to the carbon question, I think it comes back to the, the question that Henry Jansen posed quite a while ago now as to whether or not we can store carbon or do we have to use it and, and work I that John Sanderman led whilst it's one of his last papers whilst he was still at CSIRO about a decade ago, um, looked at long-term samples from the weight rotation trial, um, not too far away from the house um, behind my head in the in the um, background. And we found that yes, carbon had increased in, in stock, stocks had increased, but in those um, treatments that were supporting those higher stocks, which were mostly pasture dominated, we also had higher turnover of carbon. And I think that's that's not too surprising unless you're building an inert form of carbon. And I bet the only reasonable way of doing that would ultimately be repeated applications of biochar. Unless you're doing that, the carbon that you have is dynamic to an extent on a continuum, I guess. And But you will have a small amount of label organic matter from which nitrogen is, is mineralized. And I think the question that, that sits there is, whilst we might not be able to completely get our heads around a full, complete, comprehensive mechanistic understanding of absolutely every situation where nitrous oxide may be emissions may be prevalent. We have to accept that whilst keeping carbon in the ground is required to keep the carbon side of the balance there, there will always be occasions when there are spikes of nitrous oxide that happen over that same time frame. So if your target is 25 or maybe 100 years permanence for that carbon, I think it's. The, I think it's an absolute certainty there will be some increased nitrous oxide emissions periodically over that time frame and trying to get a handle on what is a reasonable, I guess, discount on that carbon. Um, sequestration of the carbon itself that's in the soil um, needs to be considered. Okay, thanks. thanks. So from my own perspective, I think that, the, I mean, I think the, there are lots of conditions still that the soil is not well managed and they're still it's still losing carbon so the so it's it's it it is still relevant to the climate climate mitigation potential i think that uh, not everyone is doing no till i think there's still a large part of the world like even the us that europe that are not using no till and, and it also depends on uh, which part of the region. So I think in the last webinar, we see that uh, there are evidences in uh, in 
for example, in Brazil, where no-till is, is especially increasing carbon, the overall carbon stocks and so on. So, yeah, I think that's a, it's the implication is that uh, I think it's soil carbon, soil carbon management or so probably not saying uh, soil is still losing carbon and we still need to manage it better to 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 at least not not releasing more carbon in the soil and so on. Okay, so are there do you have any other questions you'd like to talk about Jagdis or to discuss about? We often talk about uh, that there is potential of increasing soil carbon stocks. Uh, but in my experience um, in intensive cropping system, uh, it's it's very short term. Uh, and farmers just change and, and they are not changing for the sake of, sake of changing, uh, but it's beyond their control if they change water management, uh, whatever car you have accumulated or stored, it goes off as carbon dioxide very quickly. So um, uh, I'm one of those you, who, who don't, don't tend to think or believe that uh, there is huge potential of uh, increasing soil carbon stocks. Uh, but again, emphasizing what I said earlier, I think it's the dynamic uh, element of whole carbon, the labile pools, it's kind of driving the nutrient cycling is a, is absolutely important, and and that's what we call as soil health. Thanks, JK. So maybe a, a last last uh, last message you'd like to get across, Mark. Yeah. Uh, a last question from me, Booty. So uh, do you have any last last statement you uh, um, you would like to share? I no, I, th I think I think ultimately, this is I think this is this is a classic area where I think it's impractical to seek for the perfect answer. Uh, there's plenty of you know, my data is just a snapshot of plenty of others showing peculiarities and difficulties with how nitrous oxide seems to behave in very in what appear on the outside relatively similar situations and very different things happen. Uh, there are so many different pathways going on. And it's so costly to measure um, perfectly. There's no hope of measuring it, I think, comprehensively enough. So I think that I think what is what I would say more than anything is, is that people who work in my sort of space down at mechanistic level need to do a lot more talking with people like Shelby um, so we can get the best estimates because both are required. The only tool that is going to represent, be able to be useful at the national and global level is modeling for this. And it's incumbent on all of us, I think, to to get the best understanding of uncertainty in those situations. Thanks, Mark. Shelby? Yeah, plus one to Mark's comment about opening the, the conversation channel. So absolutely. Um, so we can continue to refine estimates um, and be communicating at the, the uncertainties that still exist, but also what we do know about these practices and the general direction of change that we expect to see. Uh, and yeah, I think I kind of wrapped up with my final point in my slide deck just about this need for a, a wider systems thinking approach and right, we really need to be thinking, you know, not so narrowly about carbon, you know, expanding to thinking about nitrogen and nitrous oxide emissions trade offs, but also just thinking more widely about the food that we're growing and how we're growing it right we really spent a lot of time today thinking about the kind of how, how we manage land but also thinking about the what. Um, and right, there's a lot of competition for land. Land is being, um, I met with colleagues earlier this summer um, about just how much pressure there is on land to deliver on all of these different goals, not only for climate, right, for food, for water, um, for energy. And so uh, land is under a lot of pressure. Um, and so really, again, maybe coming back to this point about opening conversation is, you know, working across disciplines, working across sectors. Uh, to really get a handle about, you know, you know, we only have so much land, it's a finite resource, and really what is the best use of it, um, and how can we think a bit more imaginatively um, about how land um, should be used. So I'll wrap up with that point. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thanks uh, for the interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Certainly, this is not uh, definitely or the, the final 
the final uh, conclusion or the final answer, there's still a lot more that uh, that needs to be done. And, and surely that when we talk about carbon, we have to talk about nitrogen as well. So both are a couple, but it's not necessary one if one goes one goes up and the other goes up as well. So uh, there's still more works to be done. And uh, hopefully this will start the communicating between the, the modelers and also the, the experimentalists so that uh, uh, at the end, we have a clearer picture, not the complete picture, but a clearer picture of how it's going on that so that we can uh, provide a better uh, assessment with least, least uncertainty. And thanks everyone for your uh, presentation and uh, your time for uh, listening and hope to see you in the next uh, webinar series. Thanks everyone. Bye thanks bye. Mark, thanks Shelby, JK. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.